All right, take your Bibles, please. Turn over to the book of 1 Peter in chapter number 4. Thank you, Brother Dirksen. Oh, Sola Mio is that song. Huh? Oh, my soul is what that means. Um, all right, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7. Verse 7, if you would, please. Um, it is the job of every wife to make sure your husband stays awake. And it is the job of every husband to make sure your wife stays awake. And it's the job of every parent to make sure your kids stay awake. Because the only thing, I would never want to do this every Sunday, because the only problem is, is that you've got all this food in your stomach right now, and all the blood is rushing to your stomach, and you're going to fall, you could fall asleep. So I have an extra songbook here, just so you know. No, I know what I got. I have water, which is even better. Anybody remember I preached a message on springs of living water and I splashed it on the congregation? Anybody remember that? Well, that is going to happen again if I see you sleeping. Okay, so everybody has been warned, all right? All right, stand please if you're able to. First Peter chapter 4, verse number 7. Am I, am I on, Brother Dan? Okay. Um, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. And what? Am I not on? Okay. All right, now? Okay. Be ye therefore sober. And Brother, Su Brother Tudor, make sure you're sober, okay? <laughs> Try it. All right. And watch unto the prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Father, thank you for the the subject and truth and doctrine of grace. It is such an amazing truth. And Lord, I am so grateful that this year you have spoken to our hearts many times about it. Now, Lord, speak to us tonight. We want to get this grace in our life. We want to see it working. We want to see it manifested, Lord, in our church, like, Lord, we have never seen before. And so, Father, everything comes about in some way through preaching. And so please, Lord, use the word of God and we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you again for standing. We're talking about gifting grace, gifting grace. And this morning, as, of course, you were here, you understand that when you got saved, and, of course, I wish I would have had the paper still on here, that you got the gift of salvation. That was the box that had salvation. But within that box, when you get the gift of salvation, you also get what else? A spiritual gift. I believe just one spiritual gift is what you receive. Now, um, sometimes we have, how many have ever taken the spiritual gift test? Have you? How many have said, boy, I think I have two or three of those? And I don't believe that. I believe you get one gift because that's what the Bible says. I think that you can manifest other gifts. I think you can learn other gifts. Amen? You may not have the gift of ruling but you maybe had parents that were good organizers, so you learn to organize through them. But everybody here has one outstanding, God-given, grace-given gift that God has in your life. And this is the thing that will motivate your life. This is the thing that if you will discover it, if you will unwrap it, if you will use it, this is where you will feel like, you know what, I am doing what God wants me to do. I am fulfilling God's plan. And, and you're energized when you do this gift. There's some, because you, God made you. God placed this gift in your life. And so when you do it, you feel like, man, I am, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is the gift that I am supposed to have and use to the glory of God. And, we'll, and I'm going to help you with that. I'm going to help you to understand, discover it. I'm going to help you to unwrap it. And I'm going to help you by the grace of God. I'm going to pray that God will get every member of our church to use their gift. Because if you use the reason why God does it this way, because God wants to keep harmony and balance in the church. 
And, and that's one of the things that he condemned about the Corinthian church. That was, what, from what I've understood through the years, is the Corinthian church was the most gifted church that Paul started. But the problem was they were using the gifts with the wrong motive and the wrong way. And some said, I want that gift of tongues. I want the gift of healing. And they were seeking gifts that weren't their gifts to see. And so there was fussing and feuding in the church. But if you know your gift, if you know what God has placed in you to be used for His glory, then man, when there's a job that needs to be done, and hopefully, and by the way, these last couple of weeks, you know what I've been doing? I've been analyzing everybody in our church. <laughs> you know, I've, I, I, you know, I got Brother Bill pegged, and I got Mrs. Lislin pegged, and actually, they're not hard. They're pretty easy to peg. And other people in our church, because when there's jobs to be done, I believe that the Spirit of God places you in a church. You said, but I just chose to go there. See, that's the problem. You think. <laughs> and, and, the, and the truth is that God places you in a church if you're the kind of person that is looking for the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so when he puts you in a church, he has given you a responsibility in that church, and the, and the responsibility to be fulfilled is going to flow through your gift in your life and using that gift within the church the context of the church i'm not a parrot church guy i'm a church guy amen god made you to get into a church and use your gift to help others in that church so we're looking at gift and grace and i said in the close of the last service that before you're going to discover it unwrap it and use it, then you're going to have to have certain attitudes. And you'll understand why when I'm done with the four attitudes. It's going to bring it all together, and it's just going to make sense why you have to have these attitudes. All right? So four attitudes. The Shanks already have it figured out over there. They said, we already know what the four attitudes are. They've been looking at the verses. And they are in the verses prior to this verse. So number one, here's the first one. Number one, an expectant attitude. You have to have an expectant attitude. Look what it says. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. It says, but the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Now, one thing that is clear scripturally in the Word of God is that the early church lived expectantly for the return of Jesus Christ. They live. They live expecting the Lord to come back any day. By the way, I think they lived more expectantly than we live now. And, and, and truthfully, we see the day coming. We see the day approaching. In fact, I've, many of us have talked and said, man, I believe that the Lord's coming back in my lifetime if God doesn't take me the next year or so. I just, I mean, everything is there. Everything is in place. China, Russia, I mean, man, it's like the, the, the chess pieces are there. All God's got to do is checkmate. That's it. And so, and, and as a result, the people there in the early church, man, they, they lived a certain way because of their expectant attitude. I think they were more fervent in the way that they served in that early church because, again, they expected the Lord to come back. And that is clear in the Scriptures. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 says, looking for that what? Blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is Greek text that is present tense. That means every day, they were looking for the blessed hope. They were looking for Jesus to return. So they lived with an expectant attitude. 2 Peter 3.12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. The word hasting means to desire earnestly. It was kind of like what we all felt at the service before the meal. We were, we were looking forward to and hasting unto the meal. We were earnestly desiring, man, I can't wait to get in there and eat, right? And some of us more than others, I'm sure. But the point is this, is that that is how the people of God lived in those days. They were, they were looking forward. They were looking for the coming, and they were actually earnestly desiring for the Lord to come back. I picture them getting up every morning and saying, even so, my Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Saying, Lord, we want you to come back today. I wonder how many... How many of you do you get up in the morning and pray, even so, Lord Jesus, come? 
It's the last prayer in the Bible, by the way. Very last prayer. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. I think we ought to be praying that every single day. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. So we need to be looking, have an expectant attitude. Uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That's the rapture. The gathering together unto him is the rapture. There is no word rapture in the Bible, but that word rapture literally means to be plucked up. It means to be gathered together. Or look at James. Look at James chapter 5 and verse number 7. So we're having an expectant attitude, an expectant attitude. Notice what James writes. And by the way, all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the New Testament, we find these things. Notice what it says. It says be patient. That mean, by the way, patience, being patient means faith that endures in times of trials. Be patient. They were being persecuted at that time. Paul, James is writing, saying, be patient. Your faith needs to endure. Why? Because they were waiting for the Lord to come back, and they believed He'd come back at any time, and they wanted to be faithful. They wanted to be faithful when Jesus came back. They wanted to be found faithful. And so it says, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, the farmer, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience. And for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also, like that farmer, patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And so how did the Lord, the, the, how the Lord was going to come back? They believed he was going to come back in their lifetime. And, but he didn't come back, did he? And then after the next generation of that, he didn't come back. But can I tell you something? The fact that Jesus has not come back does not invalidate the promise that he has made. He made a promise. He will keep his promise. He says that in 1 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. Or that means how we sometimes we expect people to break their promises. But not the Lord. He says, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And folks, let's remember something. If the Lord has not come back, I think the reason why is he still wants people to get saved. I really believe that. You know, I pray every day for people in my family and people I've known through the years. I pray for them to get saved. Uh, and I pray before that, that Lord Jesus, you come back. But I, many times they'll say, Lord, but I know why. You're, if you don't come back today, I know why. I know because you still want people to be able to get saved. Now, people that haven't heard the gospel after the Lord comes back, they will be able to get saved. But those that have heard the gospel before Jesus comes back and they don't get saved, they're, going, they're, they're not going to be able to get saved after Jesus comes back. They're going to believe there's going to be a strong delusion that's going to come. And they are going to be easily deceived. And, 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 and it's explained there in 2 Thessalonians. Because, because they rejected the truth, listen, they're going to believe a what? See, when you reject the truth, the only other option is to believe a lie. And so that's what's going to happen to them. But praise the Lord, people that have not heard a clear presentation of the gospel are still going to have an opportunity. But there's a lot of people that know the gospel. They still have chosen not to be saved. And so we, we understand why the Lord is not coming back. We understand that he wants people to get saved. In fact, verse 10, after 2 Peter 3, 9 says, but the day of the Lord will come. Amen. He said, but the day of the Lord's going to come. That's when Jesus comes back as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night. You don't say, none of us, if we know, so, you don't say, well, the thief said he'll be here at 2 o'clock, so let's get ready. No, you don't know when a thief is coming. And he's going to come when, obviously, when you don't expect that to happen. And that's the point. God wants us to live expecting every single day. Why? Because we're going to see the Lord someday. And, and listen, we're going to stand before the Lord someday. Listen, everybody. Everybody. I'm going to give an account of what I did as a, Christian, as a husband, as a father, Christian father, Christian husband, uh, what I do as a Christian, what I was as a pastor, if I'm going to get the, that special crown that pastors get. 
But you're going to stand before the Lord too. And really, that's, I, I thought, rarely do you hear a subject on the judgment seat of Christ. And yet, you know what? You're going to be judged, not for your sin, because that was already judged on the cross when Jesus died. But you'll be judged for the way that you use your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I tell you, that, that ought to kind of scare us a little bit. You know, when I was, um, I, I was the oldest of five, and of course, like every family of parents, you know, when your kids are real little, you don't get to do a lot of dating, because um, unless you have family around to do that. Um, and my parents didn't go up many dates. I remember my aunt and my uncle sometimes watch us, but most of the time my mom and dad always wanted to be home with when we were little. But I remember when we got old enough, and I was old enough, I was 12 or 13, that my dad then said, you know, Joe can watch the kids and be in charge. That was a mistake, of course. Um, <laughs> But he said he could do it, and so, you know, I, I, and so there were times that my mom and dad went out, and I always loved it when they go out, because they usually went to get Italian food, and they bring it home and leave it on the counter. When I got up in the morning, I could eat it. Amen? And um, so I remember one time specifically that I was in charge, uh, my sister Robin, my, uh, my brother Nikki, uh, my brother Mark, and my sister Michelle. Is that five? Yeah, that's five. And, and so I was in charge. And, you know, uh, usually I, had, I didn't have a problem. I'm the older brother. And, you know, a brother is born for adversity, the Bible says. And so my brother Nicky, though, and Phil will attest to this, you know, my brother Nicky kind of liked to fight a little bit. And we kind of fussed every once in a while. You ever remember seeing my brother, me and my brother fight? Yeah. We fought, we fought a couple times, too, didn't we? Uh, and, um, and so, anyway, so we, something happened. I don't remember what it was, but he got upset at me, and, and I just wasn't going to have it. And, you know, my belief was, if you're the boss, you, 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 you are subservient to me. And, and I'm the, I was the dominant brother. I was the alpha. Amen? And so he wasn't doing it. I could, you know, I could just knock him down. It was so easy. It was pitiful. And knock him down. So finally one day he was just getting really belligerent. And man, I was done with it. So I punched him, you know, knocked him down, got him on the floor. So I used to have a thing I used to do that I would get him on the floor. And, and, and I'm not trying to teach. By the way, do not do this at home. <laughs> you kids, no, Carmen, don't ever do this at home. Just, uh, Riley, don't do this with your sister. You're the old, I know you look disappointed. I understand. So I used to get on him like this. And, of course, you know, his body's here. I'm sitting on top of his chest pretty much. And then I take my, le because he was trying to hit me. So, you know, the, how you solve that problem is you put your knees on his, on his arms. And so there he is. His head's right there. It's a beautiful sight. And... <laughs> And so I shouldn't have done it. It was wrong to do it. But I just slapping him in the face just like this. And I'd say, now, you're going to, I said, you're, you're going you're gonna to stop, right? You're going to stop. If I let you up, you're not going to come after me again, right? No, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. All right? And that's what I would do to him. When we were outside, I'd take pieces of grass and stick it in his nose. Aren't you glad I got saved? <laughs> I'd stick it in his nose like that. I'd put it in his ears and things like that. Well, well, you know, I know my parents are coming home. I just don't know when they're coming home. And I wasn't really living with the attitude of expectation. So here's the living room, and then the kitchen's right here, the door, the, the, the door to go. There wasn't a door, but the opening into the kitchen was right there. And then straight ahead, right there where that brown door was, that was the door that went to the hallway that went to the patio that went to the garage where my parents would park the car. Amen? <laughs> by, the, in the, by the harbor where the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the meter is to put the quarter in it, okay? <laughs> I envy die and fill because they come back and they got this great accent I miss it so much and and so here I am doing this to my brother all of a sudden that door opens up and my mom and dad walk through the door now my mom I could my, I'm not worried about my mom 
But when my dad saw me, I literally turned yellow <laughs> because I knew I was in for it. You say, what did he do to you? You don't even want to know. <laughs> now, the reason why I was doing that is because I wasn't expecting them to come home. I should have. I should have been thinking. And by, I should have. I, sh I was so dumb. I was doing it right in front of the door. At least I should have taken them back in the room. <laughs> but there was no expectation. There was no fear. There was no concern in my heart. And I'm afraid that that's the way some Christians live. They don't think about the way that they're living, and they don't think about the fact that, you know what, the Lord could come at any moment, and basically He could come through that door and catch us doing things that we should not be doing as Christians, or catch us not doing things that we should be doing. And so that's why when it comes to discovering, unwrapping, and using your spiritual gift, one of the attitudes that will help you to be able to do that and to want to do that is if you're expecting the Lord to come back. I don't know about you, but I, would, I, I found my gift a long time ago, and I've been doing my gift for many, many years. I, would, I wouldn't want to be a Christian for 40 years and never have found my gift and never have used it, yet there are multitudes of Christians who, who are not, have not found their gift, don't care to find their gift, and certainly are not using it when God gifted you. God gave you something special just for you to use in His church to minister and to build up saints of God and sinners. And it's so important that we live with this attitude Jesus said in Luke 12, 40, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. He said that back in the early church days. My friends, it's still effective right now. Be ye therefore ready for His coming. That means if you know there's something you should be doing, do it. If there, you know there's something you're doing that you should not be doing, stop it. Look at Luke chapter, Ro, or rather Romans chapter 13. Look at verse number 11. And I'm going to be done at 2.30. No, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be finished. I'll, be, I'll just be done. Okay, Romans 13 verse 11. Uh, Romans 13 verse 11. Oh, this is a good verse. Look what it says. And that knowing the time. Now, you, we need to know the time, folks. The time is close for the Lord to come back. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Sleep, wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation. That means, now, obviously, you, you folks been in church, you know salvation there is not the salvation that you get saved. It's the salvation when the Lord's going to come back and take you out of here. He says, well, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And that is absolutely true. Look at the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. See, God exhorts us in 1 Peter that we should keep on living our lives as a Christian because of the preciousness of our salvation, because of, uh, in spite of suffering, even though, because these people were being persecuted at that time. And he didn't give them a pass, say, all right, I understand you're going through a hard time, so it's okay, you don't really need to live the Christian life. No, he was saying in spite of the persecution, in spite of the suffering, he says you need to keep living the Christian life. And then, of course, because because of his second coming. We need to just, you say, Pastor, it's just been so hard lately. I understand that. I do. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is coming back. And you need to live out your Christian life no matter how hard it may get. No matter how much suffering you may need to do. You need to live for Christ. An expectant attitude. Number two, a serious attitude. Look, look, at, look at 1 Peter 4, 7 again, but the end of all things is at hand. And then he says here, be ye therefore sober. And the word sober means to be of a sound mind. It literally means to be sane. It means to be a right mind. It comes from a Greek word that means to be self-controlled. 
Now, a lot of times we use the word sober. It's used in the context of uh, drunk, you know. Are you drunk? No, I'm sober. And, and, and by the way, really, that's not wrong. Because when you are drunk, you're not in your right mind, right? But when you are sober, and when somebody hasn't been drinking, you say, I'm sober, you're in your right mind now. And you're thinking right. And that's exactly what the word sober means as a Christian. We need to be thinking right. We need to have the right mind so that if we have the right mind, we can then be self-controlled. Typically, and by the way, which leads to a serious thinking, a serious mind, a serious attitude. If somebody is serious about something, typically they're self-controlled. If, if, all right, if, if you're serious about a job, I mean, uh, you're serious. This is a job. I want to do good in this job. Man, I want to be the best Christian I can be in that job. If you're serious about that job, guess what? You'll probably get up good and early and make sure it's a job early. You are more self-controlled. Does that make sense to everybody? Seriousness leads to self-control, to control your life. And that is what the word so means. So you need to have a serious attitude about what? About the things of God. Every parent has had a, at maybe some point a teenager, a young person, where they're just not serious about things. Maybe they're not serious about their chores around the house. Got a flippant attitude about it. Maybe they're not serious about the, some responsibilities that have been given to them. Maybe they're not serious about cleaning their room like they should or doing their schoolwork. They're not serious. And maybe a parent has even said, even said to them, hey, son or, or daughter, uh, you need to get serious about this. Well, that, that's what the Lord is. And by the way, when a, when a young person is not serious-minded or have a serious attitude, that, that's distressing to a parent. That's upsetting to a parent. And, and I have to believe that it's, it's distressing and upsetting to the Lord when a child of God is not serious about God and the things of God. If you were God and you sent your son to die for someone's sins and you paid the price, your son paid that price, and then you saved that person, I would think you would be serious about doing what that person says. Amen? I, I've told the story when I saved my, my, uh, my sister Michelle's life in a pool. And I pulled her up out of that pool. I was, just, I was just, what, 11 years old, something like that. Pulled her up out of the pool and saved her life. She was drowning down there. And we, everybody thought she was up at the apartment at my uncle's. And, and my mom said, go back and check and see if she's around the pool. And I looked around the pool. I looked up there and, uh, nobody was there, and I kind of was going to walk back to the apartment. Something said inside of me, said, you know what, go up there and look in the pool. So I got up, I looked in the pool, and there was my sister at the bottom of the deep end. And, you know, I'll never forget it. And every time I go home, she reminds me of it. Um, I, she's standing on the bottom of the pool. Her arms are stretched out like this. Her mouth was moving, crying, obviously yelling something. And, and she could see. She said, Joey, I could see you. But I couldn't, for the life of me, get up there. And then, I, obviously, I, I, don't remember, I don't even think I really knew how to swim. But I knew it was my sister. I knew she was going to die, so I dived in. I don't remember anything there. I just remember them pushing her up on the banking. I remember I yelled before, before I jumped in, said, Hey, everybody, she's in the pool! And by the time I got her up, there's my mom, there's my dad, there's my siblings, my uncle and cousins, and, and pulling her up there, and, and thank God she lived. Boy, you know what, after that? She was just six years old. She came up to me that afternoon. up, at, Joey, do you need any iced tea? <laughs> Can I get you something? I mean, let's face it, a big brother, a little sister, do that to me. It's like, wow, what's going on here? I remember just a week later, we were in a store together. We were standing in line, and, and uh, there was a guy standing in front of her. And so she must have been about five or four, something like that. But she, uh, she's standing there, and we're standing there together. And uh, she tugged on the guy's pants like this. And, and the guy turned around and said, yes. She said, Mr., this is my brother, and he saved my life. 
And she told that guy, that, for whatever reason, at that point in line, she just wanted to tell somebody that I saved her life. You know what? She was serious about that. Ought we not be serious about what God did for us? Ought we, not, ought, we, ought we not have a serious attitude about how we're living? And ought we not have a serious attitude when it comes to our relationship with God and spiritual things? You see where we're going? This is a progression. First of all, you've got to have an expectant attitude. You're thinking, Lord could come back at any moment. Man, I need to get serious. I mean, let's face it. What if we knew? What if we knew? That tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon, Jesus was coming back. What if we knew it? What would we change? What is it that you are doing or listening to or watching that you know, man, I am stopping that right now. Because you know when he comes back, you are going to stand before him. Don't you think we would all get Serious? If we knew it, in just 24 hours, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. How many people, when they came, and Christians, when they came to the point they knew they were going to die, that they started getting things right? They found that they had cancer, and they knew their time was short, and they said, man, I, got, I want to get my life in order now. I want to say I'm sorry to so-and-so. I want to make sure this is right and this is right and this is right. Well, and I mean this seriously. This is the way we should be living every day. With an expectant attitude. With a serious attitude. Paul wrote four times in the Bible to be sober-minded. He says it once to pastors. That's a qualification for a pastor. A pastor has to be serious about the things of God. And we would expect a pastor to be. But I'm going to tell you, in Titus, he talks to the old men, be sober. He talks to the young men, be sober. He talks, he says it this way, he says the older women are to teach the younger women to be sober. I think that covers every church member, don't you? So what does that mean? Every church member should be sober. And let me say to anybody that's 40 years old and above, you need to make sure your testimony is a child of God, and shame on you if you don't, that you're a sober Christian because you're setting an example for the younger Christians. And there's a lot of younger Christians that don't want to have much to do with Christianity because they see what the older Christians are doing. And there, by the way, if you're a parent, you need to be sober-minded. You need to be serious about God. I think, dads, if you possibly can, your kids ought to see you or know you're in a room somewhere reading your Bible and praying. They ought to know that. They ought to know daddy's serious about God. They ought to know that mama's serious about God. They ought to know that older siblings are serious about God. Man, we need to be provoking each other unto love and what? Good works. And that's one of the ways you do it. Sober-mindedness. Look at, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Ten minutes, ten minutes. You're doing great. Nobody's falling asleep. Nobody's falling asleep. <laughs> you know, the best thing a mom can do, a dad can do, uh, it, it says to the wives of, um, of unsaved, of, of an unsaved, no, yeah, wives of an unsaved husband. It, it, you know what it says? It says that, don't preach to him. But here's what it says. It says you would, you'll, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not quoting, I'm quoting here, uh, where he talks about the fact that you just, you, 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 don't, you don't preach to him, convict him with your word, you kick him, convict him with the word living in your life. Your chase conversation. By, the, by your life, by the way that you're living your life, that that soberness in your life could be used by the Holy Spirit of God to bring that unsaved uh, 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 husband, that unsaved wife, that unsaved children, whatever the case may be, unsaved co-worker, unsaved cousin. I mean, you just live out the Christian life and let God use that. But there has to be a seriousness of God. And if, you're, if your family, your friends, or co-workers know you're a Christian, but you're not serious, you are hurting them. 
You're hurting them. And you, and you guys that work in secular jobs, my goodness, I've, I've said it some, I envy guys that get to work in a secular job because you get to be a witness for the Lord. You get to show the seriousness of knowing God and they can look at your life and say, man, I want that. We've got to be sober. We've got to be serious about the things of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Let us, let us not sleep. Now, the word sleep there is not the one that we would use for when a Christian dies, God likens and he just goes off to sleep. And then, but it's lazy. It means lazy and dead, as do others. But let us watch and be what? Sober, be sober. For they, that are, for they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, Christians, child of God, who are of the day, be sober, be serious, be right-minded, be self-controlled because you've got the right mind. Putting on the what? The breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's the coming of the Lord. For God hath not appointed us the wrath. In other words, the Lord's going to come back, and, and when he comes back, it's going to be just before he begins the tribulation period. God's not called us to go through the wrath of God that's going to come about in that tribulation period. No, he's going to take us out first. That's what he's talking about. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, and that's the grace of God, isn't it? Whether you are awake and you're alert, and what, what is that song we sing? Uh, I'm alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. Right? Amen. Well, you guys aren't doing, boy, it's a good thing I'm done in seven minutes, so you ain't going to last much longer. <laughs> huh? I'm alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. I'm alive, alert, awake. I'm awake, alert, alive. I'm alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. Hey! Amen? <laughs> you guys, fakers. Come on. <laughs> Amen. Hey, what? Oh, okay, thank you, Brother Justin. <laughs> that's, that's, that's something else. Look what he says. He says there, whether we wake or sleep, doesn't matter. By the way, if you are one that's lazy, aren't you glad he's going to take you to heaven anyways? Huh? Aren't you glad about that? God said, all right, you're a deadhead, but I'll still take you. <laughs> you're dead as a doornail, but I'll take you. Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Somebody say amen. amen. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. And, and that next word in what? Edify. Build each other up. Build each other up. Encourage each other. Give, when you encourage, give, them, give each other courage. Put courage in people. Uh, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So what am I saying? I am saying we've got to get serious about God. So the attitude. You've got to have an expectant attitude. If you don't have an expectant attitude, you probably don't have a serious attitude. I mean, if you're really not even thinking at all about the coming of the Lord, if it's not really a big deal to you, then I doubt very seriously you could be very serious about the things of God. It goes back to what I said. I hate to be redundant. But if you knew God was coming back tomorrow, I, th I, I believe every one of us would get serious about God. Don't you? I can't imagine anybody not. Get serious about God. Get serious about loving God. Get serious about spiritual things. Reading your Bible. Get serious about that. Don't be a hit and miss Christian. Man, get up every day. Read your Bible. Amen? Amen? And pray and seek the Lord. There is no way that any Christian is ever going to discover, unwrap, and use their spiritual gift, grace gift, if they are, don't have an expectant attitude and they don't have a serious or sobering attitude. I don't know about you, but I want to be serious about this thing. I'm excited. I really am. I am so excited. I was telling Brother Bill the other day, I just I can't wait to preach this because I know it's just so good. Amen? And I just I can't wait to help you unwrap your gift. You know, how many of you parents would attest to the fact you don't care about what you get anymore? You know? You know what you love? Is watching your kids unwrap their gifts. 
Don't you love that? Just love it. And, and when they get happy about it, you're happy and you're excited. In fact, isn't it funny how sometimes we're more excited about the gift than they are? Huh? Have you had that happen? Oh, I just, oh, moms are good at this. Oh, I just was so excited to give this to you. Open, open, open. And they open it and, oh, oh, that's a nice shirt, Ma. Huh? And, and mom's like, oh, I thought you would be more excited about that. Some of you look at me like, I get what you're saying, preacher. Honestly, that's, that's how I feel right now. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to help somebody in our church say, Pastor, I know it now. I understand now what my gift is. I, can I watch unwrap it? <laughs> now, but, of course, if you unwrap it in front of me, you know what I'm going to say next now, right? Use it. <laughs> Come on now. Use that thing. Don't just go home. Don't, don't just sit in the pews. Use it. That's what God intended for it to be used. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful truth. Gifting grace. Oh, my, I'm glad grace didn't just give to me uh, salvation. I'm glad you said, I'm going to give you a special gift. And it's going to be such a joy for you to use. You're going to love it. You're going to enjoy using it. It's going to be the motivation of your heart if you're spiritual. And that's what I desire, Lord. That's what I pray for. And so please, Lord, help the folks here in uh, Faith Baptist Church to desire their spiritual gift, to, to really say, I want to I get it down. I want to know and I want to use it. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I realize we had an invitation this morning.